But anyway, he's starting out uh, with one of her dreams from the previous lecture, just uh, finishing it up. Okay, uh, Christiana Morgan, by the way, I just, uh, uh, a little bit of an introduction to her, I think. Uh, you know, she was in fr from America. She was, uh, had a lifelong relationship with, um, with Henry Murray, who was also a psychologist. Um, you know, uh, she, uh, you know, is very beautiful. And I don't know if you ever, if you ever read the book, Translate This Darkness, which is by the same woman, I think Claire Douglas, who, um, uh, you know, uh, is the one that, that compiled the notes, the vision seminars, uh, you'll find that Young kind of, uh, you know, had a pretty close relationship with, uh, with um, Christiana Morgan. And he, you know, he did have a, a, a very close relationship with um, a lot of, of women, you know, and you can see uh, Christiana Morgan, this is when she's older, was a very beautiful woman and uh, um, and yet she's very mysterious you know she's just a mysterious person and uh, so anyway um, she I think was um, probably uh, about uh, 30 years younger than young just guessing that she was probably born in 1906 or something maybe or maybe a little earlier than that but I, maybe Jan can find out for us, but I didn't check it. But anyway, here's her first dream. I mean, not her first dream, the one we'll discuss. She finds herself in a graveyard in a devastated area in France. Okay, this is 12 years after the end of World War I, you know, and that area between the no man's land, between, uh, uh, well, uh, be, between Germany and Belgium and France was just... Uh, totally um, destroyed by the war, the heavy bombardments. Uh, the graves were, uh, she's, the graves were, she's in a graveyard in the devastated area in France. And the graves were made of red sandstone and she saw people walking over a large grave where many soldiers were, were buried. And someone said, look at this gravestone. And it was a large, tombstone and upon it was carved in the figure of a saint and beside it the figure of a bull and in spite of the fact that both figures were carved in stone they were alive they were half dead and half alive so they were moving so they this is a strange uh, interesting image to half dead they look like they're dead but half alive they're moving so you can see that they're moving not with complete um, vivacity. They're just uh, some, some of a, a very uncanny movement. And uh, she saw that the bull was gnawing the figures of the saint. And she felt nauseated with horror and walks away shaking her own hand as if to be free of the bull. And she's, so she's showing her partial identity with uh, the uh, um, with the saint by doing that, you know, and uh, then she gets into an automobile and uh, she drives down a very steep hill, and it seemed to her that the brakes of the car might not be strong enough. Hi, Tim. We're just getting started here, uh, talking about uh, we got a dream going with uh, Christiana Morgan. She's in a, a graveyard in France. The, uh, a lot of people are walking over a, uh, a large grave where many soldiers are buried. And someone said, look at this gravestone. And there's the large tombstone. This is the one that's on the grave with the many soldiers buried in the same place. Is a, is a figure of a saint and the figure of a bull. And the bull is gnawing the figures of the saint Christiana shakes her hand, showing her that she's trying to get rid of the ball too. And then she gets, now here's, here's from this, that, okay. Uh, it's a completely different second part. She gets into an automobile and drives down a very steep hill 
and it seemed to her the brakes of the car might not be strong enough. She felt very frightened and emotional, but at last she got down to the bottom of the hill in safety. You know, now this is a very typical dream that we all have. But now you are going to hear just unbelievably profound uh, comments by, uh, by Young on this. I mean, it's just one revelation after another. Okay, now, first of all, th this was the dream in the previous lecture, and there was a discussion at the seminar on the difference between a shaman and a saint. And, you know, uh, what Young's best friend and kind of colleague, uh, Peter Baines, uh, says that the shaman, uh, the, it, it, the, the difference between the shaman and the saint refers to how they relate to the anima, okay? The shaman comes, it accepts the rule of the, of the anima as the spirit of his profession, calls it his metier, but it's the, uh, he, he um, accepts the rule of the anima as the spirit of his profession. The saint rigorously excludes the, just a second. Uh, the saint rigorously excludes the anima, yet both are determined by her. Both the saint and the shaman have been determined by the anima, but the saint rigorously excludes it. The effort of the saint to exclude anima-relatedness uh, forces him into his attitude of isolated absolutism, you know, where the shaman whose profession is rooted in anima relatedness is uh, very related uh, as a social personage in uh, whatever uh, tribe he's in, you know? So, I mean, he's very related where the, where the saint um, puts himself off to the side, you know, it, in isolated absol uh, absolution, you know? Now, uh, Young, this is Young says it puts the question in the right light, and he says um, his first um, uh, uh, say, he say, says the saint is is a also a product of a social and a civilized differentiation, which the shaman doesn't have. The shaman is a product of nature and depends on nature, and so when when Baines says he depends on the anima, you know, as the, as the, uh, the or the rule of the anima is the spirit of his profession, um, Young says the anima is nature. So he depends on nature. And so the shaman is enveloped by the unconscious and he's a part of it. And the unconscious functions through him, okay? So he's um, so he has, he's as acting more as a medium uh, of for the unconscious in the um, in the conscious world. The saint lifts himself above the unconscious. He defeats the unconscious, but at the same time he fulfills the unconscious. So so you know um, where the shaman is um, is. Uh, uh, enveloped by the unconscious all the time. He's part of it and the unconscious functions through him. The saint tries to lift himself above uh, being just um, in the unconscious and yet through this fulfills the unconscious. You know, I mean, through this defeating of the unconscious. So the unconscious intended this all along, you know, but then uh, we're going to find out why is the bull then gnawing the saints figures if he's the fulfillment of the unconscious. Well, um, it's a paradoxical, but it is the nature of the unconscious. And then Jung talks a little bit about the unconscious on one side is nothing but nature. But on the other side, it is the overcoming of nature. So the unconscious is not only nothing but nature, but it is also the overcoming of nature. So it's this yay and nay uh, in itself. 
And he says, this is why we will never understand the unconscious. Uh, because um, it is the world, at, it, it, it is and it is not. And you know, you know this because it is, uh, um, now remember the unconscious are these images that um, when we experience them and are aware of them, now we can also be, uh, and he's gonna talk about this in a second, we're, we're being moved by the unconscious and don't know it, but when, when we seemingly are lucid, you know, what we do with the images of the unconscious, which aren't us, and if you have a dialogue with them, who are you having a dialogue with? You know, that's where it is and is not. And that's the overcoming of the unconscious by having a dialogue with it. But who are you having a dialogue with? There's no one there. You know. But um, he's going to talk about this in a very illuminating fashion here. So um, this, uh, it's an antinomian statement. Uh, it, it, uh, it reaches the end of our reasoning powers. And antinomian means against the law. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's something, it's a borderline phenomena. You know, in other words, uh, we're experiencing something that's not in reality, but it's not nothing. So um, it, it's not in our reality, but it definitely is alive. And we can see that because it moves of itself, you know. So the saint is a production of the unconscious and yet is the overcoming of the unconscious. Now in a Buddhist saint, every word, every act overcomes the unconscious, overcomes the illusion of being unconscious. But the, uh, the, he's overcoming the illusion of Maya, you know. Now the Christian saint overcomes the unconscious by rising above it. And the saint will call it the devil, that he's overcoming the devil. But that's kind of a good commentary on what the devil is. I mean, what the saint is trying to do is trying to be the fulfillment of the unconscious. So what he's calling the devil, he's the fulfillment of the devil, you know, or the fulfillment of nature, or the fulfillment of the uh, unconscious. And this was the intention all along. And he's saying, I'm overcoming this um, chaotic, undifferentiated uh, 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 realm of, of possession, you know, by rising above it. But actually you are the product of that and they wanted you to do that all along. So it's uh, really interesting uh, that you get into this and, you know, it's, it's hard to wrap your head around it, but it's very interesting. The shaman is the power of illusion. He himself is imagination and uh, uh, illusion at the same time. And he's subject to the power of illusion and is, and is made to work through it. So he's, he's a, a medium who gets into a trance and works through the trance. Well, what, what is he in a trance for? You know, it's, uh, uh, why is he in a trance? In other words, he's, awakened uh, some other, it'd be like a medium in a seance, you know, this suddenly this other voice is, is coming through. And uh, this is what the shaman is, is the, uh, the medium for. So now we're, we're going all, all, we're going through all of this to figure out why is the bull gnawing the same figure? Okay. Uh, so, so defeating uh, the, the, um, uh, so the shaman really is not defeating the unconscious. He's defeating his own uh, ego. He's defeating, um, see the difference between, hi Adam, the difference between someone who's in a participation mystique and a uh, 21st century, uh, you know, illuminated being is that he has uh, removed him, he has differentiated out of the participation mystique and has a very strong presence uh, uh, as a, an individual, one who is individual, uh, someone who is who's who's tr who has come differentiated out of the unconscious. Whereas the shaman is trying to defeat that. Um, 
differentiation and move back into it and then speak as a living being out of it. So he's trying to defeat his individual status, return to the depths, and then work uh, his um, through um, that, um, through being, uh, going, returning to the source. That's what, and the saint is also though, is, uh, is unconsciously forced by the unconscious. You don't become a saint um, really by uh, choice, <laughs> not a saint. You might, you, you could do something else uh, by choice, but not become a saint. You know, uh, it, there is a idea of your force. So what, is the, what the saint is after, and you analyze uh, what the saint is really after, knowing what the saint is really after and analyzing his symbol, uh, symbolism, it is the unconscious that, try, that tries to overcome itself. So if you analyze what the saint is really after and you analyze his symbolism, you see it's the unconscious trying to overcome itself. You know, where the saint says he's trying to um, overcome the devil, he's overcoming nature. So um, now, uh, the, now Jung talks very interestingly about this role of nature trying to overcome itself. Uh, and in, in the dreams of, of the people at the Bergolsi that he worked with, uh, a woman that had been confined there for 20 years, he, had, he wrote down all her dreams and uh, they had a rhythmic development that really displayed the um, process of, of nature trying to overcome itself. Uh, she, she would have winter dreams that spoke of the destruction of the world, uh, where it was empty and she was almost existence, non-existent. And then she'd have spring uh, dreams where there were positive symbols um, would occur, the sun rises, and it, it, the, the dreams took on a lovely aspect, and you feel right away uh, that there is a living, living and positive resolution to her, um, you know, being in um, a mental institution. A beautiful symbol of individuation or rebirth arises, and you think to yourself, she must see this, but she doesn't see it. She cannot grasp it. Um, it, it passes as uh, some sort of a miracle. A lovely vision happens, and I do, don't know where it occurred on another star, yet she's not touched by it. Uh, this pillar of life passes by her and, uh, and then comes winter again the destruction of the whole thing. And it's this regular cycle. So um, he just has noticed this. Now, this this is all tied together. I don't know if I can give give the uh, implication of that, but I mean, the, the bull, the this difference between the saint and the shaman and the saint, the saint where the shaman tries to defeat his egohood and move back into the depths. The saint tries to rise above nature and overcome it, you know, um, and uh, uh, so this, uh, so then Young says about this woman, if she could catch it, she would be saved, but she has lost her hands. She cannot grasp it. So opportunity passes. Um, she's, and he says, she's like the lame man who waits on the bank of the healing pool She's unable to jump in, so she can't be cured, you know. And uh, he he remembered, uh, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Ryder, Ryder Haggard. He, he, Young quotes this book uh, a lot called she who, Mu she, it's she who Must Be Obeyed. She has to stand in a pillar of fire where she's almost destroyed. But right before she's destroyed, she attains something like a mortal life from it. So it's a, a description of this eternal cycle of death and rebirth, which is always revolving in the unconscious, where the nature tries to overcome itself. You know, the unconscious tries to come overcome itself. 
and and it's remember it started out by um, Peter Bain saying that the um, that the difference between the saint and the shaman was the anima relatedness where the um, saint where the shaman uh, hit the the spirit of his profession is being related to the anima the, the uh, saint has to exclude the anima uh, to reach his sta stage of ideal absolutism. And there is an object of, of uh, saintlyhood, unless you're like Meister Eckhart or maybe Tilar de Chardin or maybe St. Francis of Assisi, you know, uh, they, they, these are real saints, you know, I mean, ones who, uh, whose revelation was illuminating to everyone, you know, um, that then that, that isn't really ideal absolutism, you know, uh, where, you know, you wear a hair shirt, and, you know, you're just always punishing yourself. They actually, something comes out of it. I was going to say too, um, you know, about the Enantia Dromia, uh, just talking about the saint and the shaman and the winter dreams and the spring dreams and this cycle of death and rebirth that always goes on in the dream maker within us. You know, um, that term came from Heraclitus, you know, the, not the um, uh, running into yourself, you know, and uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey is an enantiodromia. The, the Iliad is the uh, journey away from Greece. And then the Odyssey is the reach, almost the impossible return back. You know, but this is described as an enantiodromia uh, uh, cycle or saga. So I don't know. That kind of is is sort of what's going on here. You know, uh, but okay. So now um, we're we're just uh, so so she's uh, in the autumnal part of the cycle. Cycle, the unconscious seems to be intent on destruction. Everything is dissolved. Everything goes under. Dissolve and coagulate. You know, there's this uh, uh, idea of, and we're going to find out, this is why the bull uh, is gnawing the saint's fing fingers. He's, the saint becomes sterile, you know, and he needs to return. Uh, this, this, the bull is really an example of the creative force of the, uh, uh, of the Ottoman winter dreams attacking this um, uh, uh, thing that becomes sterile, you know. So uh, one tends to, to conclude after you hear a lot of autumn and winter dreams uh, that the tendency of the unconscious is to bring everything back to its elemental condition and there is no synthesis or symbol forming at all. But then you get to the spring part of the cycle and one concludes something entirely different. The unconscious wants synthesis. It wants symbol making. It wants to rise above itself. You know, but first it wants to start with the elemental condition. So this is in, in our dreams where you have the point of departure, you know, um, you know, with the, you're always returning to your, uh, to your high school, your grandparents' house, your childhood home, your high school or whatever, um, it, 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 you go around and uh, uh, you, you're going around again in the same cycle, but this time with hopefully a little more subtle, uh, it's going to be a little more, you're going to learn a little about circumambulating the center, you know, and of course that's the, we mentioned it several times, but that's what uh, the poem of Little Gidding, where you return to the place you started and see it for the first time, you know. So that's that's this object of uh, the, uh, it's also the object of the enantiodromia too, you know. So um, the unconscious wants synthesis, wants symbol making, everything is, builds up to it and there's nothing destructive about it. So, um, so uh, there's, there never was any, uh, there you don't see any will to destroy. And it, um, so it depends on the moment that we're observing the unconscious 
One time it's negative, another time it's positive. It's contradictory in itself. Otherwise, it would not live, it would not move. I mean, in other words, the nature, uh, the unconscious, the realm of images has a polarity within it of dissolving, coagulating, and then out of it runs, um, you know, comes the philosopher's stone again, you know. But at some point, the philosopher's stone, even the philosopher's stone, is going to become sterile and it needs to be dissolved and start over again. So um, life is a becoming thing. If it's not internally arising, it's uh, dead or it's dying or it becomes sterile, you know? So um, it's a, um, the, and this is what, you know, the um, inexpressible joy of life invincible of, of this um, principle of youth, you know? And this, this is really illustrated in the fairies. Um, the fairies live forever. They don't need anything. They don't want anything. They don't have to eat. They never die. So now isn't what, what isn't this this ideal state? No, you know what they do? They go and they steal babies, human babies, and they bring them to the fairy hill. And what they leave in the, their place is a wizened old fairy who assumes the uh, assumes the shape and the form of the baby that they took, and he's called a changeling, you know. And so, you know, people always wondered something's wrong with that baby, you know. So they do something really odd, and if if it was so odd, they, it would force this wizened, wise old fairy to reveal himself. But so what does the fairy hill lack? It lacks the promise of youth, you know, um, this new thing that's always growing, you know. So that's, this is going to be very instructive, I think, on our own dream lives. Dream lives. Uh, the contradiction goes as far as it's an existent non-existence. It's not merely a nothingness. Nirvana, nirvana is non-existent existent or existent non-existence. It's positive non-being. And now that sounds like real gobbledygook, but really it is. You can have a dialogue with this thing, you know, and we're going to find out what and the nature of the dialogue here in just a second here. Uh, the uh, unconscious is exactly that. It's a yay and a nay in itself and uh, undoes itself to absolute nothingness and then creates itself out of nothingness again. And and does this sound familiar? This is the myth of the creation of God as well. You know, uh, the unconscious is yay and nay in itself and it undoes itself to absolute nothingness and then creates itself out of that nothingness again. And that's the myth of the creation of the gods. You know, God creates himself in the world out of nothing and then it goes back again, you know, and starts all over again. So the, the, the myth of the God coming out of nothing is really the story of our own unconscious, you know, and our own dream cycle, you know, that there is always this thing that comes out of nothingness uh, that is the new heroic thing that has a life cycle, you know. Anyway, it's, it's very, this, this is, I don't know if I can communicate how profound it is, but it really is uh, amazing. De the definition of the saint holds as long as we are moving into, uh, as, as long as we stay in the world of superficial phenomena. But if we go dirt deeper, we see the saint is, is this uh, unconscious overcoming itself. So um, the unconscious wants to dismember everything, bring everything back into its beginning, is also creating the most beautiful jewel. So the unconscious that wants to dismember everything, bring everything back into it to its beginning, is also creating the most beautiful jewel. The essence of synthesis, which is the symbol, that is so paradoxical that one is bewildered by it. But if we know the unconscious is a nay and a yay, we simply have to settle down to the idea that it is utterly incomprehensible. 
uh, to, to the mind. And so in the dream, the attitude of saintliness is to be repressed by a factor symbolized by the bull. So uh, the bull is the, that's gnawing his saint's fig fingers on the, this gravestone that she saw in her dream. It was half dead, half alive. And the bull is gnawing uh, the fingers of the saint. And then she has to shake her hand because she's identifying with the saint. The bull is the creative force, um, is, uh, but st still undifferentiated. And it's compar comparable to the Mithraic bull, the bull of the beginning, and the world bull. The bull of the beginning is the blind, unconscious force, representing, in this case, a great value because the attitude of the saintliness is at a culmination and an end. And anything that is differentiated and has reached its completion is beautiful and respectable and good and noble, but it's sterile. So after it reaches its completion, um, it, it is run dry after a while. So one may admit that it's beautiful, but it doesn't work anymore. It's not effective. You know, it's, uh, uh, you, know, you know, it's lost. It's um, like any dead idol or dead god at some point it's going to lose its effectiveness it need, it needs to it, it, in an indigenous society the myth is constantly informed by the dreams of the members of the society so it's always changing always you know and and it also would change their language i mean uh, uh, you know it used to be that if you uh, could go back in time 80 years before there was written language, you wouldn't be able to understand the people talking 80 years ago. I mean, if you actually listen to uh, early recordings by Thomas Edison of presidents back then, they have such a strange speaking style. You know, I mean, it is, it's, um, there's, there's this thing that's always uh, being informed, but not our myths, our myths are dead. So, um, the, so this, um, uh, so one may, uh, the, it's lost its effectiveness. It's lost its efficiency. In this case, the unconscious is bringing up its contrary, the contrary of the saint. And this contrary of the saint, the saint who is risen above uh, the unconscious, risen above nature, is the undifferentiated blind impulse of nature, the sign of spring. Now, in, in, in astrology, astrology bull, the bull, Taurus and Aries are the sign of spring. So this bull is the sign of the new thing coming, this undifferentiated creative force. And uh, astrology, again, I don't know, where did astrology come from? You know, I mean, it's this uh, projected uh, psychology of the unconscious. And how could it be anything else? You know, it's so um, strange. And yet, uh, you know, uh, Taurus the bull is the sign of spring, the creative part of the unconscious cycle. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's leading into uh, then Aries and then Christ is the last ram and the first fish, you know, it leads into Pisces and then young is the last fish. And the first water bearer leads into the water bearer. Uh, you know, um, where did this come from? But this is seen in our, our own unconscious. She's seeing the bull uh, because she's reached this sterile dead end as, an, as a thinking type. And uh, that she needs this unconscious spring uh, form of, of the unconscious, which is the bull. And uh, it's as if the saint was standing in the west in the autumnal equinox, and then Taurus would be the vernal equinox, uh, and is now uh, in the fishes. It's moved back on account of the so-called procession of the of the equinoxes, you know. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, this is this is him analyzing the bulls gnawing the same fingers. So the next part of the dream 
Hey, my guy, comment on that. I mean, he's going to move to the next part of the dream here. So it's uh, the difference between the shaman and the saint. You know, one is related to the anima, the other one excludes the anima. The anima is nature. The saint excludes nature. The saint rises above nature, but is the fulfillment of it. That was its intention all along, you know. So um, anyway, the next part of the dream, which is not connected to the first part, uh, which was decidedly mythological. So the second part of the dream is about an automobile and they're driving down a very steep hill. The, the dreamer was, was driving and there was a fear that the brakes would not hold. She s s feels very uh, frightened and impotent, but at last they reach the bottom of the hill safe in safety and this is the descent okay she has the dream of the bull gnawing the figures of the saint and now we move into this descent and you know i thought very much of uh you know uh, tim your dream uh with the two descents you know uh when i was hearing about this this is a descent and in the light of what went on before it is perfectly clear the culmination or the good the desired thing is always thought of as being above and visible. A town is built on a mountain. A town built on a mountain cannot remain hidden. So the culmination of the good thing, the desired thing, is always thought as being above and visible, never below and invisible. You know, it has to move into to the clear light. It has to be glide. You, you know, the word. Um, of uh, uh, Zeus, Dios, Theos, uh, the word that we use for um, uh, to describe the highest thing, which is the highest God or whatever we call it. It means the shining one. You know, that's what it means. So this, um, the, the culmination of the good thing, the desired thing is always thought of being as above in heaven and very visible, the light. You know, and uh, so the town was built on a mountain that cannot remain hidden is this um, uh, is a, you know, it's a parable. So um, anyway, uh, this is, this keeps getting really interesting. I hope I can communicate it. Um, the, the situation is, is that one should find the creative principle. The one uh, when the thing above has lower efficiency, the saint is now sterile, naturally one must go down to the blind thing. So now she's going, re she's going down to the realm of the bull, you know, cause she knows that the bull, uh, it, it's time for that spring dream. The dark thing, which is always thought of as being below. And so you going down also has the mythological meaning of the nekya, it's a Greek word which meant the descent to the dead. Um, you know, it's interesting. This is all a off the cuff lecture by Young, maybe an hour and a half, you know, about one dream, you know. Uh, so so uh, it's a Greek word which means the descent to the dead into Hades. So whenever there was a difficult situation which can't be solved or a question which can't be answered by ordinary means, People need to go down to their oracular cave or to a hidden spring, like the spring in the temple of Delphi from which the prophetic vapors uh, rise. The idea is that the secret place is below. The secret place of renewal is below. Um, uh, you, you know, you've reached a point uh, where, um, you, you know, nothing seems to taste good anymore. And you need to start, uh, you, you, you need something, something is missing. The, uh, uh, so the uh, initiations always took below the surface of the earth in a cave, like, and it's like immersed, full immersion baptism, you know, you need to go down into the depths. The, the caves of Mithra uh, in Italy were uh, real caves at one time, and, and um, the fathers of the church uh, s s often spoke of the spelea as being in rocks, natural grottos, natural churches, where caves, 
in some steps far below the surface of the earth. In Syria, there was a church that was 365 steps down. The initiate had to go back a whole year in order to reach the chamber of initiation. And it is the symbolism was reflected in old Norman churches, which had an under church, you know, a church under the church and uh, uh, where they would bury um, the dead in crypts. They wouldn't bury them, they'd just be put in a crypt. So now you're in a church and below the church are, is the realm of the dead, literally, you know? And that was where sometimes the secret services would take place. So you can imagine having a service in a church where you know right below me is just full of people who have been dead for hundreds of years, hundreds of people, you know? I mean, now doesn't that feed the energy of the sacred place a little differently? you know, than uh, Robert Schuller's Crystal Palace or whatever it is. You know? so, uh, in the, uh, um, so in the cold of Mithra, that people were not admitted to the creep, but, uh, crypt, but only uh, real initiates went down below. But there were peepholes where people could look down and get glimpses of the mysterious doings. Um, so, um, the community was uh, kind of shut out, excluded from the mystery play that went on from the altar. And, uh, but the psychological idea is the same, that the creative principle, the creative forces below should be faced and assimilated into consciousness. In other words, that the initiate needs to go down into the, the realm of the dead, into the realm of the ancestors. And he needs to uh, face that, assimilate it, and then when he comes up back to the surface of the earth, he can instruct everyone uh, because he, I've been to the realm of the ancestors. And then everybody gathers around because they know that this is life wisdom, you know, that he's bringing up, not, um, you know, factual knowledge. He's bringing up a, um, the healing thing, you know, the symbol really, it is, it isn't, um, it's really bringing a, a, the symbol of new growth, you know. Now, this is, this is why in some indigenous tribes, everyone was so excited when someone had a dream. And then they'd all sit around and, and listen to the dream. And it would feed, it would be the new thing that would feed the myth. And the myth, the, the myth of, the, of the tribe would be influenced by these dreams, you know. And so it's moving. You know, they haven't, their, their myth was always alive, you know, and it's, um, and so it's perfectly justifiable that the situation should uh, arouse some fear going down into the depths, particularly the fear that the brakes are not strong enough for there's some acceleration in going downhill, that path to the unconscious, the speed has a tendency to in increase. You know, I mean, it also has this feeling, I think, of the destruction of the ego. You know, uh, the ego feels threatened. So uh, the one finds when one takes the downward path that after a while, it's, um, uh, it's almost too easy. And if you uh, give your little finger to the devil, he takes the whole arm and finally the whole uh, body. The dream assures her that's what the destruction of the ego is. So the dream assures her that she has reached the bottom and is safe in relative safety, but it doesn't exclude the possibility later on other fears will come. Uh, it's, it's sort of like he says, going down a, a, a mountain and then reaching a plateau on the mountain, but you're still, you know, there's descents uh, to come, you know, so the, and, um, Young says, when the unconscious makes a statement like this, it is unwise to assume that it's a lie or a cheap consolation. She is safe, but only for the time being, you know, uh, that uh, it's like sliding. Yeah, he says sliding down the steep hill at, and hitting a plateau. And at the, at the time she had this dream, Young didn't know it, but he found out a little later that she had gone so far down into the strata of the historical mind that um, 
she'd reached a lev level where, where she could objectify um, the unconscious contents, you know. Now, um, let's just talk, he's going to talk about the uh, objectification of unconscious contents. Um, and first he says that the mind is built in some sort of a strata. There's a top layer, which is uh, our actual consciousness, but below would be historical levers, la layers and levels. And the, the next layer below consciousness would be the consciousness of our youth. Now, that always haunts us. You know, what could have been, I wish I could go back, you know, and live, live over again. So that's the consciousness of our youth, which seems to be always very close to us. And then there's the consciousness of the level of the parents and the grandparents. They have, they have their own uh, little message to consciousness, the parents and the grandparents. And then farther down uh, are other layers, which get more medieval and very much farther down would be the layer of the man who does not possess his thought, to whom the mind was something which has appeared outside of him, uh, like the primitive who, who has no psychology. Uh, he's going to give a very interesting example of this. Um, it, uh, the uh, psychology uh, appears outside of ourselves in um, all the archetypal figures in as much as they are constellated uh, appear. Now, this is for the the one in a participation mystique. Uh, they uh, they are constantly appear outside of us in animals, in men, in trees, in rocks, and so on. So he doesn't think; it thinks; it speaks. An animal or bird told it to me, or he heard the trees whisper together in the night, telling secrets. I didn't think that. I heard the tree whisper it. You know. I didn't think that um, an, a, a bird told me, you know, um, and so um, this is a an actual. Now, this uh, the reason it's important to mention this is because this is the level of consciousness we want to get to if we want to objectify. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that, but the, this is not to demean. The, the life of participation mystique, that's where the shaman goes to get his healing wisdom. And that's where somewhat we want to go too. We want to, um, we'll, we'll talk about it in just a second. The, all, all the original revelation takes place in this level. All original revelation takes place in this level uh, where the, uh, the trees whisper in the night and tell us secrets or a little bird tells us. Um, this is where mind is objectified, where it seems not to belong to us, but to a definitely to a strange factor. But now we can hear it, and but it's not us, you know. So we're just acting as uh, the listener, and we're not um, overpowering it with our um, saintliness, our fact that we've risen above nature. I think that is should be emphasized in the figure of the saint, at least in her dream. It's that force which in her that was not saintly, but the one that has overcome nature and has separated itself from nature. So let's not say the saint. Let's say the um, that aspect of of our all of us that is separated from the anima, excludes the anima, excludes nature. You know, and through that uh, aspect of through ego excluding nature, it's risen above it. You know, and through through um, the saint excluding the anima, he's he's risen. He's achieved the level of ideal absolutism. You know, which is um, what the ego. It's both its its incredible power, but also its incredible sickness, and why we are broken. You know. It's, but it also is why um, it has an incredible power too, you know. So it's it has that contradictory aspect that is in the need of the enantiadromia, you know. It, we're we're needing now the od uh, the Odyssey. We we finished the Iliad. Now we have to go back, you know. We have to return to the beginning, and so um, 
anyway, uh, th this primitive layer is still alive. People are always assuming that certain thoughts belong to themselves, uh, are thought by other people. They are so convinced of it, they don't even ask questions. Now, he's going to give a wonderful example of this. I think it's one of his really beautiful examples. Uh, that um, uh, he said that a lot of his patients always assumed, and this is maybe you too, people assumed you, maybe uh, someone uh, were thinking such and such or so and so, and that your intention was such and such. When you never, you never considered that, but this, this is what they th thought you thought, you know, but this was their own thought, but they thought this was your thought and they're telling you what you probably were thinking, you know, and uh, hi, Kevin, uh, we're getting to a really good part here in the, the thing. So anyway, uh, they, they never stopped to consider whether uh, what their opinion of what young uh, was thinking about them or about uh, what his intention was with them was true or not, but they almost, it was as if Jung had told them and he just sat there, not didn't say a word, just the expression on his face. So, uh, you know, you know, um, he, he uh, would ask a, um, a, a patient would have a dream about a cocoon, okay? And Young would say to him, now, what do you have to do with a cocoon? You know, and she has no idea. She said, well, I don't know. Any, I don't have any thoughts about being a cocoon. I never thought about being a cocoon. And, uh, but then Young would say, okay, but what do you think that I think about a cocoon? You know? And they said, and then they, the patient would suddenly be unleashed. Oh, I know exactly what you think about the cocoon. And then they would go on and on with what Young thinks about cocoons. But this, these are their own thoughts, you know? I mean, that's what his point is here. It's an example of the objectified mind, you know? And this is, this is really the, the whole idea of what does Young think about the cocoon is the whole idea of uh, active imagination dialogue, where you go ask a question to some uh, figure who's not yourself. And then when the answer comes back, it's not, uh, it, it, if you do it long enough, Barbara Hanna says, the answer that comes back to you will be the objective mind. It will be a, it'll be a, a, a thought of the imaginal world and not of the ego. So it's, it's this um, aspect of the objective mind. So it's a, a small little vision. And if you do it long enough and then you go back and read it six months later, you'll say, God, that's so profound. I, I would never have been able to think of that, you know? And, uh, um, and plus it's, it's, a, it's a great form of informing ourselves. And then, you know, my uh, uh, unconscious tells me, or, you know, my anima or the great mother tells me that you need to go over these and over these and over these. That's the part of being the empty vessel of the realm of images. That everything, every dream you have, every drawing of a dream you do, all these active imaginations, they need to fill up what is your empty vessel. And so you, you, uh, to, to, you're filling up your uh, 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 empty vessel, not with the subjective thoughts of ego, but with the objective mind, you know, and this is this is the object of that you, um, you, you as in being in service to this, you'll get more and better dreams, you know, and this of the Nascapi, that was their whole impetus. How do I get more and better dreams? And that was to be in service to them, you know, uh, but um, so anyway, um, uh, Young said that he could actually build a uh, technical, and, and you know, when they, uh, all these things that would come out about what Young thinks about the cocoon, um, I didn't 
he says I hadn't the faintest idea of anything they were talking about. And, but he said that this was a uh, real technique that he started to use. And what he says this is describing as an example of is uh, the primitive mentality, the objectivation of the mental process. Now, he's trying, what he's getting to here is what the nature of visions are. This is where we're going, okay? And it's, so keep in mind that this objectiv objectivation of the mental process is eventually going to lead to the nature of visions, okay? That's what, where we're going. So it's, it's an amazingly frequent, but, not, uh, but naturally quite invisible to the people concerned. It, it happens all the time. Uh, and it's, um, uh, it, this, this is one of the gifts that a, uh, the Nascopi have as they think with objective mind. He's gonna give an example uh, later of uh, uh, some chief uh, in Africa who uh, was elected overall king by all the vassal kings. And then he gives a speech like this. And he says, he says, um, the river flows into the lake and the lake is surrounded by the woods and the woods um, go up the mountain. That was his whole speech, you know, and uh, you know, this was, uh, but Young said that we look at it and think it's, it's nonsense, but every one of those had a great symbol to the people who were hearing it because they knew that the river perhaps rep represented um, clarity and purity and the lake represented peace and the uh, uh, trees represented the growing thing, the mountains, the stillness that surrounds us or something. I'm just, I'm not exactly, stating what the, he thought but i mean that's the idea that those um that speech uh, was um not one of the uh, directed mind so in the uh in the in the case of christiana morgan it's a uh, what the whole thing is about is a sacrifice of her superior function okay this is what the whole dream is about is the sacrifice of the superior function and the return to, uh, or a um, descent to the inferior function. You know, the one, uh, so um, that's what the, that's really what sacrifice means. You know, whenever, it isn't sacrifice of the ego, it's sacrifice of the superior function because it gets in the way of objective uh, mental processes. As long as we stay in the, in, in, the, in the dominant function, everything is subjective. And this was the, the rule in alchemy is to um, objectify the personal and personify the objective. You know, in other words, that and everything that, uh, that uh, has to do with us, like an example would be, um, I'm very angry right now. Okay, draw a picture of your angry, anger, put it over there and say, yeah, that's what, that's exactly what I'm feeling right now, right there. But wait a sec, that's not me, it's over here. You know, so I mean, you're, you're creating a distance. So you're objectifying the personal, but then you personify the objective. You know, you ask a question of someone who you at least give a role to, the anima, the great mother, and then she, you give her that role or name, and then you, you talk with her as if she's a person. So now when you talk to the objective mind, you want it to, to talk to a person. When you take your own thoughts, your, your samsara whirl, whirlwind that goes on in the dominant function of the subjective part of ourselves needs to be objectified. At least what we mean by objectified is to create distance between it and the center of our awareness. So we want to clean out the center of our awareness of all the things that are infecting it, you know, with distance, you know. I mean, in other words, becoming the witness of ourselves and not just to be trapped in the tornado of ourselves, 
you know. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, he's in the, the, it's a, what, what a sacrifice is really is the sacrifice of the dominant uh, function of the civilized man, which is our own function. And it seems like a sacrilege. The you know the thing that has our greatest achievement is that part of us that we need to sacrifice right now. You know whatever we've achieved, the highest level of achievement is what stands in the way of our future growth. You know, uh, and uh, uh, it he's he's and this is what she's doing. You know, and that's why the bull is is nibbling the fingers of the ego. It's saying that you need to return the creative force uh, below. So um, uh, the, to reach the primitive level is a reverse sacrifice. It's almost a sort of a black uh, mass, you know, for it's necessary to give up certain accomplishments, man's highest ideals, um, his, you we need to murder Siegfried. Uh, his 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 thinking must be pure and true. Uh, now, in order to reach the level of objectivation, uh, objectifying, uh, it can no longer maintain uh, this kind of thinking, and uh, uh, which is uh, you, you know is uh, the thinking uh, often. And Jung describes it here as the. Um, uh, where it is this killing thing, you know, where uh, it, it, it grasps and it's almost a, a bird of prey, you know, it grasps um, it's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's a bird of prey that seizes its object, tears it to pieces, separates it from its surroundings in order to acquaint itself with it. You know, and that's what intellectual grasp is. And the only way that she's going to be able to have visions is to lose this. So the int intellectual processes are really based on separation, endless acts of cruelty, which means cutting through, cutting things down, excluding things. Now it distresses the feeling type because it means dissecting a living thing and tearing it asunder. And anyone with feeling naturally objects, for he feel or he or she feels the cruelty of such a procedure. And the intellectual person is distressed by what the feeling person does with the intellect, and the feeling person is distressed by what the intellect intellectual person does with feeling. So the feeling person has a rude and is as rude and cruel and uncouth with thinking as the intellect is with feeling, you know? So at the primitive level, uh, you see the mind, but there's no separation. So this is where the shaman uh, is trying to get rid of the, um, this, 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 this differentiated part of himself. And uh, the idea is to objectify the thinking. And now this is very powerful. It, Let's just keep going here. I mean, it's not, uh, I don't know. I know I'm not making it clear. You don't know what is going to happen. You are below facts. Facts pass over you like waves. You have no standpoint and your whole mental attitude is transferred into an objective process, which is not yourself. So at this point, when you're below the waves and the facts are passing over you, but with waves, you're not this, um, uh, bird of prey that seizes objects, tears it to pieces, separates it from its surrounding in order to uh, acquaint itself uh, with it. Uh, you know, um, and and he's saying that she, um, the way that she uh, seems to have accomplished this is um, through um, this um, aspect of uh, of the sacrifice, uh, and and she talks about uh, you no, know, she's an intellectual part person, and the person with differentiated feeling has to sacrifice their differentiation in order to get back to the primitive level where the mind or any other in uh, inferior function appears in its objectified form. 
So when a person does not succeed as a rule, uh, uh, it will be seen that he was too good or too moral. If you don't succeed at objectifying, uh, or if you can't get visions, you, you must uh, give up your moral qualities, <laughs> you, you know, uh, your civilized qualities. Well, well let's just go through uh, what, what she does because it's, uh, I don't know, um, maybe we can come understand this a little better later, but uh, she's, um, we'll, we'll get to the first vision. Let's just go to the first vision. Is, uh, if instead of trying to formulate something for ourselves, we should stop and talk. You, you know, Young says that, um, you, you know, here's how it works. He says um, that some patient is, um, is sitting there and he's talking with him and suddenly he stops talking and he tries to, um, he won't say anything. And then a voice behind him starts speaking. You know, how do you get to that level? You know, so now no longer the analyst is helping you, but now you're your own analyst. And this is this voice behind Young that's speaking. And the, and the idea here is the exteriorization or the objectifying of, of our thoughts, you know, having objectified thoughts. Uh, this is how to get to the realm of visions is what he's trying to talk about. Uh, you know, uh, that um, it's, it's a little bit, I, I think I have to boil it down a little bit more, but th it's, it's no longer dissected or torn asunder because there's no discerning intellect to tear them down. No, uh, no, now all we have, all we become is an eye and an ear to help us participate in the world of vision. So now uh, uh, in the dream condition, we're swayed not by facts, but by psychical processes. Uh, it, it's, um, it's where um, these, it goes along in a continuous stream. Everything is still the original connection with everything else. And uh, it, it uh, lost all the qualities of the bird of prey. I showed you some of the initial visions and here's her first vision, okay. Um, I beheld the head of a ram. Now I tell you the next, um, the next uh, half part of this lecture is where he's gonna be talking about the, what the feeling function is. And the last half of this essay, which we won't be able to get to this time, if you ever wanted to know what the feeling function is, it's there. And uh, uh, we're, we're gonna hear about it. But um, here's her first vision. And this is really her first moving vision. You know, so she's had static visions before. She's the first one that moved. I beheld the head of a ram and swiftly with fearful strength, the ram charged and was met full on the forehead by the spear of an Indian. Now that's her vision, it's not a dream. And the new element is that it's no longer a static vision. This is what all this talk about objectification was, that he's trying to get to how this is happening. And, um, you know, it was getting a little bit uh, too much ver words in there. So, but that's what the idea is. So the new element is that is no longer static vision. There's a new progress. It moves by itself. Before she uh, still retained her own uh, free will, uh, she had not lent uh, her own power to the contents of the mind. That's the objectifying factor, objectifying our thoughts. Therefore, she, the, the images had no power and there was no movement. So the first time, um, her dynamis had wandered over to the unconscious objects, they moved, okay? How do you get there? I'm not really sure, right? The contents of her, but the idea is you can see how she did it. You know, she has, uh, her, her superior function was thinking, which is this bird of prey that tears things asunder. Somehow she has uh, uh, taken that power of the bird of prey and sacrificed it. And now um, it is, the power has moved into the images, the power of, um, 
of her free will. Okay. And she, she is now just the eyes and the ears that participate in the action and not the one that moves it, the one that tears it asunder. And so uh, the contents of her mind uh, are now moving by themselves and naturally by that energy, which was formerly own and uh, her own and which is still her own. Uh, she's capable uh, of, uh, she's, she is capable of withdrawing from the vision and climbing up to the surface of con consciousness uh, where there is no such ram charging and everything is always as it was. But here the ram is charging. You know, so the moment she gives up her own power, she sinks down and the contents are moving violently. The vision begins. So uh, she's, she's given up her power. This is the idea of the sacrifice. And then uh, the, the vision goes on. Uh, the ram vanishes. The Indian uh, lays down beside his spear. Suddenly he leapt to his feet, jumped on his horse, which was black, and galloped over the plains until he came to a black pond surrounded by the black mountains. So it's black horse, black, um, black pond, black mountains. And here the horse refused to go further. It lay down and died. The Indian stood on the shore and looked for the sun, but the sun had set and it was twilight. Suddenly the Indian turned into a Chinaman. He knelt down beside the black pond and bowed his forehead to the ground three times. So now this is an actual vision that she had. Now you're going to see too, uh, what Jung calls the picture method. This is, um, Christiana Morgan had made a lot of paintings of her dreams. And see, there's the dead horse. And here's the Indian by the black pond and by the black mountains. So anyway, um, I think, I got a little bit garbled there in the middle, but um, that's the idea I think is what, what we're gonna do here is we're going to um, hear, uh, now, um, I, I just open it up to anybody that wants to, has any questions. I'll shut, I, 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 Tim isn't here, so I guess uh, we're not going to have any. Uh, you mean Gary? Oh, Gary, yeah, Gary's Yeah. There. Yeah. Well, um, anyway, uh, I, Tim, do you have any comments about anything? It doesn't have to be about this, but. Um. Well, this is, <clears throat> I find it really fascinating. Um, this last point about the, um, the unconscious energy, you know, that, that wild animal suddenly being uh, released, like the power of the, of the ego is, or maybe the, maybe the dominant function. I don't know how to separate those things right now because they're, the concepts are so close to each other. But once that steps out of the way, all of a sudden there's this power in the, in the depths that can come forward and has this kind of wildness, this unconstrained quality. I like that. I like that image, and I'm going to have to go back and study these notes more. Yeah, well, the bull, remember, first, the bull gnaws her fingers, okay? It's, the, it's a spring symbol. And remember, he's talking about the winter dreams and, and the spring dream. The, the bull is this symbol of Taurus. Now we've got the ram, which is also a spring symbol. And it, it, where the bull just gnaws the fingers, that's not something a bull would do. The ram charges violently, and it's met on the head by the nature man, you know, who uh, 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 catches it on the head. And then we'll have to find out why he turns into an oriental figure, you know, later. But uh, Adam, do you, it doesn't have to be about this, but anything else you want to talk about? Um, I'm just, I guess, kind of relating what we're talking about to like, you know, actual life experiences of yes. people. And um, so some of the broad outlines, I think, of what you were describing, or, you know, or what Young was describing, it sounds like 
you know, potentially in people's lives, maybe in big ways or small ways, um, like reaching a kind of plateau of what one might call success, you know, uh, and then having that in, in an antiodromia sort of turn like immediately into its opposite in a way where it's like that comes apart or one, you know, goes down the mountain into the unconscious and, um, you know, with various risks involved in that process. And then something new is able to come out as a result. And from what's being described, it sounds like, you know, that's probably an ongoing process, which is life where that happens over and over and in different ways. Um, so I don't know, I guess that's sort of like the very succinct summary that I would, that I would maybe give to what's being described, but <laughs> and you're, you're muted right now. Craig. Well, you got to the top of the ladder, you find it's against the wrong wall and that's what she did, you know, and now she's uh, returning to the depth. I mean, to, to be, uh, a, a, the, the, to reach the highest level in, in the ego realm is not our biological purpose, you know. I mean, it's not our ontological uh, reason for being to uh, have the ego will, con the consciousness, uh, our willful ego um, accomplish all its goals. Well, that's not our root in our rhizome. A root in our rhizome has a much different. I mean, this this idea of this woman in in the Bergolzi that kept having these un unbelievably beautiful dreams, you know, which she never caught caught because she's like the lame person who lies beside uh, the Bethesda, the healing uh, pool, but is so lame that she can't heal herself by climbing into it. Um, it's the idea of the, the ego consciousness that doesn't uh, listen to these uh, images either, you know. I'm also intrigued with this idea that the, um, the, the image of the raptor tearing apart the flesh of, the, of his prey um, As, as being a, a metaphor for how the, the feeling function person thinks of the thinking attitude and vice versa. Did I get that right? Yes, yeah, dissecting a living thing right in front of our, her eyes. You know, I mean, you're, you're tearing it apart to acquaint yourself with it. Well, that's not what the feeling function person does. To acquaint themselves with a, well, a, a bird, little bird, they don't tear it apart and see what it looks like inside. You know, they try to relate to it. You know, and to have a relatedness uh, relationship with it. Uh, they don't try to tear it apart and have just the discerning intellect, these searing eyes, uh, uh, acquaint themselves with it cruelly like that. You know? Didn't didn't I hear you say that the the thinking person has the same response to a feeling person's? Yes, yes. I mean, they um, see the the thinking function person. First of all, is kind of unaware of their horrible feeling relatedness, and but the feeling function person is not um, is seeing the thinking function person with their horrible feeling uh, value. For, now we're gonna, next time we'll, we'll learn a lot about what feeling function is, but uh, Jung calls it the function of values, you know, of, of, of valuing things for their own worth. You know, like, isn't that bird lovely? You know, yeah, it is. Let's take it apart and see what it looks like inside. You know, I mean, <laughs> 
that's what the thinking function person says. But then when when the thinking function person is doing his thinking and a feeling function person walks in the room and starts to, their thinking is very uncouth and vulgar, where his feeling is very uncouth and vulgar. You know, the thinking function, the refined thinking function person has this person walk in and they try to use the thinking function, but you know, you know, they, they just, they don't, um, uh, that isn't the way they, they navigate. That isn't what they value in their life is, is that tearing apart. Kevin, do you have any uh, thoughts? Hopefully next time uh, we'll be a little more succinct here. I was trying yeah, to get through it, but go ahead. I just like the, uh, when Tim mentioned the ego and consciousness and they are and they said something they are somewhat quite alike. And um, I am not surprised by that statement because I read Jung for many, I, I read um, Jungian psychology for many years, like every day for hours. And I felt like that that separation uh, was not really managed by Jung as much as it was managed by Indian philosophy. Like what is consciousness, what is ego? Because for Jungian psychology, your ego consciousness is your thinking, is your feeling, is your sensation, is your intuition. And so consciousness is not separated from that. And so the more you develop this different function, the stronger ego you have, uh, the stronger ego ones one have. But whereas the Indian philosophy, they understood uh, Brahman, Atma, and all of this concept, which is separated from, from the ego. Um, so Jung, I did, it's not that Jung didn't know it because um, he, 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 he does share a dream in which there is a meditating, a, another Jung meditating, which was <laughs> when and Jung says when he wakes up, you know, he was pretty sure that, that it means he would die. And so it's not that Jung didn't understand that, but Jung was more, I think he was concerned with the psychology of the uh, subject. And so for him, it was more, yeah, talking about the cognitive function and um, yeah, and not really have a clean separation um, between consciousness as pureness and consciousness as ego consciousness with its own division of um, consciousness. Well, you, you know, the one thing, I mean, I, I, you know, when I first read this, you know, I read it a few times, but every line was a revelation. And uh, one of them was the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, that, um, for Christiana Morgan, she is identifying with her saint, the saint, the one that has excluded nature from her life in order to achieve this ideal absolutism where um, it, you contrast the shaman, he's the one that excludes the ego, uh, you know, so that he can, he can, um, he, so he can, he can, be a instrument of nature. See, she, she excludes nature so she can be an instrument of ideal absolutism, which nature wants, okay? But the shaman says that he's going to get rid of his, um, his ideal absolutism, his egohood, to become part of nature and to be the agent of nature, which is also what nature wants, okay? Nature wants this dialogue because it's alive. It wants the dialogue between the ideal absolutism and the uh, and ourselves as the agent of nature and our size, uh, ourselves as one who's the dis discerner uh, of it because those two together can create the third. And you know, like they say, the philosopher's stone will not be found in nature. It can only be found the dialogue between the unconscious and the differentiated consciousness, you know, which she had went too far in that direction. So now it's time, since she had so fully developed her intellectual function, her thinking function, for her to sacrifice that and to um, now come down and view the objective mind like the shaman does, the one who takes the underground journey. So it, the dream is telling her that she needs to make a descent, you know, uh, uh, to have the bull 
come forward. And then her first vision is of the charging ram, which is, uh, is a very close analog to the, to the bull. So listening to you, I'm, I'm listening with the ears of kind of this worldwide collective problem where the, uh, where these, these two political opposites are in contention. And it seems like the, um, the primacy of that dialogue is what is arising in the collective unconscious. That, that we can't just barrel on with this idea that, okay, we've, we've sort of uh, figured out the, the, the basic problems of nature. And so now we just need to, um, to carry on to, I guess, over to explore the universe or something. And it seems like what the, what nature is doing is forcing us to concentrate on the dialogue and on the, the inherent conflict between the, um, maybe our intellectual capacity and the fact that we are constantly in relationship, that we can't overcome nature. I'm sort of rambling, but, but I'm really hearing this with this really broad perspective. Well, the, the analog for the early part of the, uh, you know, the, the first uh, millennium, zero AD, was this um, vertical uh, aspect. I think the analog now is the water bearer. Is, is there anyone in the, in the universe today that carries with him the healing water of the depths and gives us all this healing water or, or this, uh, not the healing water, but the water of connection to the source, you know? So I think in this, in, in this modern age, is there anyone who can bring us um, this, uh, you know, there's a great polarity. Can anyone bring the symbol that unites the great polarity and lifts the curse? You know, now in a fairy tale, it would be someone who had animal helpers, who <laughs> had nature helpers. So, you know, some type of like St. Francis of Assisi or something, who's also carrying a, a vase full of, full of noose with them. But I think the analog for the, the next millennium is going to be, what does the water bearer mean? Where, where is the water bearer in this age? Like in, the, in the, that age, it was, a, um, it was someone who was, uh, you know, suspended at the uh, realm of the Coturni. I mean, you could get lost in the, in the chaos of the, of the 24 news, hour news cycle, but where is the water bearer? Where is, where is the one that can lift the curse and cure the enchantment? Um, I don't know. I don't think they've shown yet. I don't know. I don't know. Marina, do you have any uh, observations? Could be about anything. Like, what did you do this week, or whatever? Well, um, <clears throat> just talking about the water bearer. We're alleged, supposed to be entering the the age of Aquarius, mm -hmm. and the age is a long is a long time. So the whole process will be a long time. Um, I, yeah, um, thank you, you know, for, for the session. There's a lot there, there's a lot there. I think my inferior function is the logos and the intellect. I think, I don't think my intellectual, uh, sometimes I struggle to keep up with you all and your discussions, but I just get a little a few crumbs and then I feed off them and, uh, and I do well, I do well with that. I, um, but just to share with you, I, I had a little dream, just fragments. I can't tell you what the content is, but I got a lovely message that I'm going to be 
dwelling on for a while and it was just the end was just like you've got to build a bridge to the truth oh. yeah well i mean each week i i have a little vision i mean this one this time was um that i first I, I finally went down to this river where the woodpecker mother is with with the anima with me you know the real anima not the fake anima this is the living one that wasn't me, you know, and she appeared all of herself, all by herself. And I felt very like full as I went down there. And, and, and you know, I felt this great fullness. And afterwards I, I threw an I Ching, you know, telling her how grateful I was. And uh, she comes back to changing lines says, no woman appreciates that kind of idolatry, you know. Uh, don't do that to me, you know. Don't get lost in your own reverie. That I'm a real being, you know. Treat me like a real being. Don't just go off. That's you talking, not relating to me, you know. So uh, anyway, that was kind of a revelation. <laughs> How about you, Charles? You got any uh, big um, revelations this week? Um, not exactly. I am still kind of like, well, okay, maybe I did have somewhat of a revelation. I guess it has been put into a much better perspective um, as to my uh kind of withdrawal from things and not engaging in life um and it came about by oddly enough um looking at a, a bunch of memes um there's this meme of this character called the doomer and um he has a very pessimistic outlook on life uh that's kind of his whole thing and um i found myself uh relating to him much more than I thought I would have. And that's kind of one of his, his main attributes is his uh, extreme withdrawal from things. And it really, I was not expecting it to give me a much clearer perspective on uh, my own situation. Um, and yeah, um, that's pretty much what's been going on with me. I had a really, uh, incredible dream the other night um been kind of had a lull in the amount of dreams i was having but it seems to have come back a little bit and um yeah um that's that's pretty much what's been going on i was really interested in the whole the difference between the saint and the shaman in this yes. discussion mm -hmm. i i found that um really interesting and um yeah i'm gonna think a lot about that well, yeah, that was the clearest part of it. I think the objectifying uh, of the mind, um, I'm hoping I, maybe I can uh, a little simplify that next time. And then, and, and the following discussion, I think will be very, uh, I mean, we'll do the next black book session next time, but then the, the one, uh, the second half of this um, uh, episode or lecture six about the, um, is you're going to, I hopefully, and I'm going to try my best to slow down and let Marina get it uh, on what the feeling function is, you know, and what, why it's different than the, than the thinking function. And in other words, Jung is trying to describe for us where Christiana what Christiana is lacking in the field. She's a thinking function person. So she, her inferior function is feeling. And, and you know, in, in psychological types, Jung was not Myers-Briggs. He wasn't interested really in what your dominant function was. He was interested in what your inferior function was. That was his whole, I mean, he and Marie-Louise von Franz, that was our most, that was really what they were trying to do was to identify what part of you was the undeveloped side of yourself because that's the one that needed help you know and so what young is going to describe is the uh um 
is what the feeling function is. And also, I, I, I want to just show real quickly, because uh, it's so uh, cool. Um, I can find a pin here. I mean, he, he takes like um, uh, this, I'm just going to show you. Like, say, this is, um, this will be, uh, let's say, um, sensation, and this will be feeling. Okay, so so here's sensation, and here's feeling. And so then here's going to be intuition, and here's thinking. And he says, the, the problem in Germany and the United States is they don't know the difference between uh, sensation and feeling. When we, they, they think that feeling and sensation are interchangeable terms, you know, where in, uh, in France, they clearly know the difference between thinking, think, feeling and sensation. But what they mix up is thinking and intuition. You know, an idea is the same as thinking. No, it's not. You know, uh, he says in Germany, they know exactly what ag agnun means, which is intuition. And it's not thinking, you know, where the German and the American. And then he gives a really good example of President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, in, uh, during the World War I said he had a feeling about something. And uh, Young says, well, he says, he says, I don't know a lot about the English language, but I have this feeling that you would never hear the foreign office of, uh, at Downing Street say they have a feeling about something. So he thought it was particularly American that they they mix up feeling, uh, they they mix up feeling with with intuition too. So <laughs> you, you you know he he was showing that that you, that the Americans mix up feeling, sensation, and intuition, or all three, because they're so strong in the thinking function, you know, uh, that uh, extroverted thinking, that uh, they almost have three unconscious functions you know, which are intuition, sensation, and uh, feeling. But anyway, it's, it's very interesting because it, it's true of ourselves. You know, if, if I'm a thinking and intuitive, and I thought to myself, I don't really know the difference between feeling and sensation. I mean, you know, completely, you know, and, and what he's going to describe is, is where a thinking person is very cold. He said a feeling function person can be very cold about his feeling, you know, I mean, somebody described to me like this is that they could um, go up to you and, and look at you in the face and say, with, without one trace of emotion in, in their voice or their eyes or any sort of antagonism or anything, they say, you know, um, I don't like you, you know, <laughs> and, but they had, there's nothing personal about it. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'll get along with you, but I, I just, you know, but anyway, it's, it's, it's going to be a really interesting discussion and it'll be particularly good for the Americans and uh, um, here, uh, you, you know, to describe what the difference between feeling, sensation and intuition is, you know, because I got a feeling, no, you don't, you have an intuition, you know. My my toe doesn't feel very. No, it's you're talking about sensation now. You know, I mean th that's the the idea here is what's the difference between your toe hurting, you having an inkling that something is going to happen, and your relatedness to other beings or your valuing that this has great worth, this doesn't. You know. Anyway, um, does uh, um, uh, Dawn or, or Harry? Do you have anything uh, and? to uh, share or not, you know, maybe, um, well, anyway, next time uh, we'll go with, uh, with the black books and I, I'll try to be, um, you know, it, it's just every single line of that thing is, is just, I have to go over each word to figure out what it means because otherwise you just pass over it. But next, I will try to, Marina, I'm going to, Try to, and you know, um, I heard Gary Sparks and uh, Jeffrey Raff said, this is the way that Marie Louise von Franz says, unless you can explain this to that uh, man down at the dumpster putting the uh, garbage in the, in the garbage truck, 
I don't want you in my class. I don't want you, I want you to explain what I'm talking about to me, like you'd explain it uh, to uh, someone who knows nothing, you know? So I have to do that too, uh, anyway. Well, uh, that's a little bit of a taste of visions. I'll tell you, it gets to be so beautiful that it is just absolutely amazing how she, uh, uh, and we'll get to also see some of her beautiful paintings too as we go through them. And Young speaks uh, as, I'll try to get him, dumb him down a little bit, but um, you know, Carrie Bain said he speaks with fire here. So uh, we'll see. Well, I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas and uh, um, that now we get to maybe get done done with 2020. And, you know, it hasn't been much happen this year, has there? <laughs> no, this was this is a pretty eventful year. Hopefully 2021 will be a little quieter. Anyway, well, well, thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. Okay, bye now.